reclaim and remember those parts of yourself. It isn't that you've lost them forever. It's that they're awaiting the reclamation. You have to reclaim those parts of yourself. And it is possible to do it because you've already done it. Today's Unreasonable Human is testament to the resilience of pursuing one's dreams no matter the obstacles. She is and always will be the talented vocalist Pixie Bennett. Hi, Pixie. Hello, Erica. (laughs) (laughs) It's so nice to see your face. I'm loving doing these um, shows because I I record them at the moment on like Google Meets and I get to see people's faces that I haven't seen for so long. And I get to have a like, yeah, I get to like have a face to face conversation with people that I love. So it's so nice to see your sweet little face. Thank you, my darling. Um, Pixie, thank you for joining me on my show and reasonable humans. Um, I have really, really loved inviting people onto the show that I want to share with the world. You're one of those people. Um, I've known you for a long time and we've worked together. We've been friends together. And uh, I think you've got such a lovely story. And I, I just, yeah, you're just one of those human beings that I find very inspiring with your attitude towards things in life. So I think that you can uh, really teach people a lot. And so, (laughs) so with that, I would like to start chatting about your story. So Pix, uh, you're a singer that is, is, would you say that singing is your passion? Definitely. Um, I think it's also been the light for me, like the light of hope, really like the driving force through, through my stages of my life. But the thing is, is that often it's taken a backseat to so many other more practical things. Mm. Um, And you'll understand this, but you have to fall back in love with music sometimes because it's attached to the music industry. And sometimes Mm. that music industry can kind of dampen your passion. Mm. So in, in going away for such a long time and not being performing live and doing music live and releasing as much, I came to that place where I could fall back in love with music again Mm. and reconnect with it as my passion. (laughs) Yeah. So tell me when you first, when did you start singing, Pix? How old were you? Yeah, early days. I mean, you know, I was Mary in the school play. (laughs) (laughs) Cute. (laughs) Yeah, I was always a big personality, a little person, but a big personality. So Mm. it was something that it was clear was a gift uh, from an early age. I was good at it. So I, um, I was encouraged throughout my life. And then I think it really broke, um, let's say I broke out into the public arena when I was about 16 or 17. um, I was in the National Youth Choir of South Africa. So there was quite a a great foundation to start start performance from because you could really understand music and um, how to use your voice. Mm -hmm. And it also was a haven for me at school because I could really throw myself into extramural activities like choir and school plays and um, yeah, and and I shone um, at that time. So I knew that there was something that would be a career for me from an early age. Yeah. And then from there, was that, when did you enter Idols? It was quite a while after that. I think I was about 23. So straight after school, I went to UCT and I studied musical theatre. And a year into it, I, was, um, I wasn't really happy. I felt that it was quite a focus on theatre and not as much on the musical aspect of it. So it just happened that I met this um, group of people that were travelling to Cape Town to shoot a music video. And it was this, like, huge African-American guy named Q. And we befriended each other and he said, ah, oh, you know, these people that I'm traveling with, this guy, he found Ace of Bass and he produced Ace of Bass's album. (laughs) So I was like, he's like, you've got to meet meet him, you know, because I said I sing or whatever. So we did a track together 
we released it in Cape Town and we performed it at Rhodes House. I don't know if you remember Rhodes House in Cape Town back in the day. I mean, mm-hmm. you were a Joburg girl. So, yes, I so was. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> But there was this Italian man that was there and he said, ah, you know, you got to come to my birthday party in Italy. So we're like, okay. So I ended up, it was the beginning of a relationship where um, I got signed to this little label that was based in Ibiza. And I went over to Italy and then went through to Ibiza and I recorded a very sunset um, style, like chill house vocals and that sort of thing. Came mm. back to Cape Town and then went back um, over to Godrum, which is quite an experience. Um, mm. The Hadi Karnas, it's actually quite a famous little spot in Godrum. And then landed up in the UK after that. And um, luckily I'm on a Canadian passport, so I managed to work there. And I was just singing in bars with the guy that I think I found on Gumtree. He was playing guitar (laughs) and we were just like doing little shows, but I was working as a cocktail waitress, as a hostess in these private members clubs. And it was quite a rock star lifestyle. Uh, We were getting paid a salary, but we were also getting paid lots of tips and we were getting invited (laughs) to some very, very rock and roll after parties. And I mean, I was young at that stage. I was only 19. So I was overseas for for a couple of years, back and forth in the UK for about four years. And I really wanted to put down some roots. So I came back to South Africa and I started playing with an ex-boyfriend who was quite a well-known musician in South Africa a long time ago. So we were doing some shows together and I started my own band. um, And this idols thing was going on. So I was like, everyone said, oh, you know, into idols. And I thought, you know, I don't know. Like, what if I go and I get... You know, I don't even get through to one of the rounds. Like I get eliminated before or whatever. Mm. Um, so I didn't tell anyone. And I went and I stood in the queue for a whole day. And to cut a long story short, I ended up making it to the top seven. So it was a wild, wild ride. Um, wow. It had its pros and cons, mm. you know, the idols experience. But what, what were they? Tell me. So because I had done house and um, I had been in music and a musician and played in bands for, you know, I don't know, like five, six, seven years up until that point, it gives you the impression on idols that they make you, you know, you're just this lone stranger that sings and, and they bring you onto the show and suddenly they make you a star, you know, and mm. it's also very pop, very pop. Um, very clean, a very clean image, very family friendly, lots of children look Mm. up to you. Mm. So it's quite different from that club lifestyle and environment. And, you know, I think I really saw how it was a con versus a pro later on in life when I decided I wanted to get back into house music and I wanted to start playing with you and with Mm. Leah and Mm. with Afro house guys. And people were seeing it as, as if I was kind, kind of trying to just get into any market that was fashionable to be in, you know. Mm-hmm. So they didn't take me seriously. It, it was hard because on the one hand, the other musicians within the South African music scene, they've worked their way up. Mm-hmm. And idols, suddenly you have a musician that's a star or whatever, and now you expect to be doing shows. And these other musicians are like, hey, you haven't earned your stripes. You haven't sung in 100 bars like us. You're not Mm -hmm. a real musician. But as we connected more with the music industry, people understood my background. And so I was constantly just meeting that barrier and having to break through it. Mm -hmm. And so also when I went into house, it was – a similar thing of which you're a, a pop idol. So it was always Pixie the pop idol. Mm. So, you know, when we talk about being unreasonable, it felt like there was definitely a voice in me saying, you just have to just keep pushing on. It doesn't matter what they say. You have to follow your love. And it doesn't matter if you did pop. It doesn't matter if you did jazz before that. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you want to do Afro house. If people are enjoying it and it's making you happy, just keep doing it. So mm-hmm. yeah, keep pushing on. Yeah. Um, you, yeah, you've, you've definitely 
always for me felt like somebody who uh, you've got a lot of grit. You've got a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I've used that word for a long time. <laughs> um, but I, I would also like to go into where that comes from. Like, where does this, you know, you've, you've, you've always had this, um, I, I, maybe to some people on the outside, it seems like self-confidence, but there's something about, I don't know if, what the word is to describe you, but you've got this self assurity You've got this, it's like you've been brought up uh, in a way that has has allowed you to really realize that that you, you can step into any role because you deserve to be there. And um, you've always been like that. You've, you, you don't, you're not insecure when, when you decide you want to do something, you're very secure within yourself and you really like are okay with, with showing who you are, which I love about you because a lot of people uh, don't, don't want to do that. They, they start to self doubt and they start to question themselves. Do you feel um, like this was part of your upbringing or do you think that this is part of who you are as a person? How do you, what would you say that is, where does that come from? Uh, firstly, I want to say I appreciate that. <laughs> I really do. Um, but I think it's a kind of a twofold answer, maybe a threefold, because on the one hand, I've been very blessed with people in my life that they haven't been perfect, but they have instilled this um, knowing in me because of their love for me and their confidence in my abilities to, you know, like my mom, like my grandfather both of them have passed away. And like teachers at school, I had a principal and certain music teachers. And so I had encouragement along the way. But I also had a tough upbringing. My mum was, um, you know, I come from a violent background. I mean, so many people can relate to the story. Um, I had a wealthy father, but my mother was super um, poor. And so I kind of went between these worlds, going one week to him, one week to my mom. And through both of these worlds, they came with different lessons. And, and I found that I had to rely on myself and I had to push myself and believe in myself. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to say that I've done it alone. Like, as I said, so many people have encouraged me. But I've had hardships that have, have helped me to have compassion for others and compassion for myself. Mm. It drives why I do things. Um, I believe in purpose-driven work. And I've always wanted to be a light and to help others. And I remember when I was a child thinking, you know, I just want to get to this place where, where I can teach people that it doesn't matter where you come from. It does not define who you are, who your mother was, who your father was, what your upbringing was. Um, I think in those experiences, I adapt and I connect with a wide variety of people, a very diverse group of people. Mm. And it's those those heart-to-heart -heart moments of just empathy and connecting and knowing that you can relate to people's stories that make me feel like, you know what, I do deserve to be here, just like anyone else. So I don't doubt that. And I've survived things that some people wouldn't have survived, which makes me feel spiritually that I'm here to do something with my life. Mm. And so it comes down to faith and, and spirituality. That also gives me a, a sense of, of trust and confidence. But I definitely have my moments of self-doubt. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> and I definitely have insecurities. I mean, I'm almost 40 and mm. I'm back in the industry and um, – I, I wouldn't be human if I didn't, hey? Like, I have Absolutely. to do some self-talk and I've got some good friends that I can call up and they can be like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you wouldn't be human if you didn't have those, um, those, I don't call them pitfalls. I think that it's important to have the, the light and the shade. It's important to see yourself when you're having those moments. And I think awareness is the most important thing. You know, when you're yeah. going through those times, everybody's going to have their ups and downs. It's having the awareness when you're going through that to actually see yourself from the outside and say, look, look what you're doing to yourself, you know? Um, but yeah, 
Yeah, that's yeah. such an important word, awareness. Hey, it's yeah. Um, it's it's important to keep checking yourself and practicing yeah. how to do that. Yeah, you. I mean, you went on quite a spiritual journey, like with your. So off. So we met. We met. Uh, we met through actually my radio show. We started chatting. We started I chatting it clearly. <laughs> so sweet i used to we got like we started chatting i don't know what it was through because in those days i don't even think twitter babe i I was was on twitter i was coming home from a gig one night down on the coast and we were driving in the car and you were always playing your saturday night show so you play such good music and i remember tweeting you back in the day when we were on twitter because i'm not even on it anymore i was like erica i love this jam or whatever (laughs) And then I think we followed each other and we just became friends. Hey? Yeah. And then I think you were, I don't know if you were in Joburg already, but we very quickly like organized uh, you, for you to come and sing during my yeah. set. And that was, it. it was like, yes, we, that was but when. You were every- freestyling, do you remember? You were, I was, was freestyling so over your sets. Oh my the, goodness. We played so, some great venues. <laughs> such great venues, such great gigs. Oh my gosh. We've had a great time together. Um, so yeah, we we met then, and you know that was also an amazing time for you. Just being a freestyle singer is also really such a great thing to do. But then after that, I, I want to talk about sort of your spiritual. I don't know. I don't know if this was a moment in time that became a spiritual time, but I, is it when you felt pregnant for the first time that there was started a, a shift started to happen? It well, felt before like before that. Um, yeah, tell me. It was, I'm trying to think now, it was about a year before I was pregnant with my son. A friend had gone to an ayahuasca retreat. And back then, you didn't talk openly about it. It was very bizarre to a lot of people. And so she confidently, in confidence told me, confidently, she in confidence told me, (laughs) (laughs) maybe not so confidently, (laughs) um, she said to me, you know, that she'd done it. And I was fascinated with with the idea and um they say that the plant calls you not in a cliched way but it just really came at that time where I was like wow I want to do this please invite me next time you go so we went down to Rustler's Valley a couple mm-hmm. months after that <laughs> and I did my first journey there in Sweat Lodge it was like a two-night thing and I remember having to set intentions before I went And I had sat, I was at a place where I just felt like there wasn't, I wasn't getting anything rewarding from music anymore because you get up there and people go, oh, you're such a good singer. Oh, you you know, congratulations, congratulations. And I I was like, that's not why I'm doing it. I I feel like there has to be a deeper purpose to singing music, especially because my music at that time, my lyrics weren't like very conscious. They were just, you know, whatever. Like they were great, but not, not kind of, yeah, not conscious lyrics. So I was questioning why music, what what they say music heals and is a vehicle for healing, but I didn't feel like I was showing up in that way. And I was also partying a lot and, and living my best 20-year-old 20, 20 self or whatever. Mm. <laughs> um, and my mum had also passed away uh, before that, so I'd had some shifts in my life. And so, yeah, that's when it actually started. And then things just slowly started to change after that. I looked at myself differently. I looked at the world slightly differently. And it sets on a, um, I think I did a couple of sessions before that. Then I felt pregnant and I didn't do any more for a while. I probably did about 10 in, in total in the last 10 years. I went quite deeply into plant medicine and into San Pedro and uh, microdosing and researching it and, and all of that and I also got very into um, Buddhist fundamentals and I'd been raised in a Christian household originally a Catholic family so there were things that were taboo this was considered the occult or, or um, something that was viewed in a negative way and for me my experiences in life just weren't aligning with that anymore and I, I was like I just need to know what else is out there so that I can decide what is right for myself? Mm. And then I discovered raw food, <laughs> superfoods, mm. um, which ties in with the journey of the spirit, um, the spiritual path, because I realized that my body needed um, 
needed fuel, different kinds of fuel. So I discovered raw cacao and chia and and all of these incredible superfoods that I was putting into my body and I was noticing a noticeable shift in my energy and in my awareness and in my ability to perceive Mm -hmm. and react. And I got so into it that I decided, right, I'm going to be a a raw food teacher. And I signed up for the six-month intensive raw food teacher training with this coach in the UK and a raw food chef. And so it was a chefing thing and to do workshops and wellness retreats. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just bring music into that space in a healing way and start helping people to transition, to slowly swap things out and swap things in. But in doing that in my own capacity, like in healing my body, so many awakenings happened Mm -hmm. and they weren't pretty you know people people think that you have a spiritual awakening and it's going to be all colors and it's going to be this transcendental incredible moment when majority of the time it can look like a psychosis (laughs) and it can be troubling for your family and um and for yourself because it's a tower moment it's this moment where you suddenly see yourself and your family and everything you've surrounded yourself in, in a whole new light. And you start to realize that things are not aligned anymore and they have to change. And in changing yourself, you, you end up changing everyone with you. So it's, it's super disruptive and it's not a comfortable thing. Mm-hmm. So I wrote that out and, um, you know, like with yoga and with, with anything you kind of go up and down. You have realizations and then you go and you have to integrate them into your life. And I finally got to this place now where it feels very gentle. I don't do plant journeys anymore. I just do breath work and yoga and follow certain texts and mantra practices. And I'm just respectful to everyone's religions. Uh, Sometimes I pray to everyone's gods because I'm like, you know what, can I just get my faces covered, please? (laughs) I understand. All the support that I can get right now. Um, Yeah, I mean, but the children were a huge, a huge catalyst for it. Mm. I didn't want to bring my past and the things that I'd experienced into behaving in a subconscious way where I didn't even know I was doing it. It petrified me. I was just like, I have to make sure that I know that I'm not, I'm not kind of repeating these cycles. And they motivated that change for me. My little yeah. ones. <laughs> Your little ones, you got two little boys. How old mm. are they now? They're eight and nine, almost nine and ten. Hey? Wow. Oh. Can't oh, believe good. it. And one of your children is a special needs. Yes, Nova. He's the oldest. Hmm. Nova means first light, and it seemed fitting for my firstborn. Hmm. Uh, he only showed signs of autism a little bit later when he was delayed in his speech. Hmm. We were very lucky we had a GP who picked it up, and then we went through for a couple years um, OT therapy, speech therapy, dietitians. Mm. Uh, different types of schooling. And what was fascinating was that I think the hardest thing in having an autistic child is that you have to grieve the idea that you have for the child you think that you are going to raise and the life you think you're going to raise. It's not so easy to say, yeah, sure, let's have a play date. We'll bring our kids and we'll all hang out. Um, Sensory impulses inputs creates um different mood swings for him and you just don't know what you're going to get it was worse back in the day it's definitely even out but basically even your socializing changes so you have to kind of grieve this idea and really just you you learn to love this beautiful spirit and soul that is your child that is an incredible teacher Mm. because if there's one thing that a special needs child teaches you it's to have a thick skin and a softer heart Hmm. I think that that has been an incredible 
shift for me is just to be like, I don't care what people think. You can go out with nerves sometimes and he decides he wants every single kinder egg in the whole display, all 30 of them. And he'll have a huge meltdown if you don't want to get all of them because he's not sure why <laughs> he's not allowed the whole thing. Mm. And he'll cause a huge scene in the shop and everyone will turn to look. And in the early days, I used to feel embarrassed. You know, I used to be like, oh my gosh, my kids are having a meltdown. Oh no, please, you know, don't look at me. And now I just, all I care about is making sure that that he sees me, I see him, we speak to each other and I've got his back. But, you know, not to care what people think. And mm-hmm. the funny thing is that since since entering that, that space, you recognize how compassionate people are. Also, things have changed. People are so much more understanding about what autism looks like, what it yeah. means to be on the spectrum. People are more educated and um, and they are so compassionate and caring. I can't think of one time we've ever had an issue like being out in public where people have been mean or anything like that. Like as soon as they understand these special needs, they're like very helpful. Yeah. And yeah. That's great. That's great. I mean, yeah, it's a, I, I think, like you say, they, our children are our greatest teachers. They really are. You know, they bring to us what, what we need. And I noticed that with my children, that they're constantly showing me what I need to learn. And, um, Beautiful kids. <laughs> I know. And so, and so do you. You've got such beautiful children. Um, and I just want to say that it's really, yeah, it's really been inspiring for me to watch you as a mother because you really haven't, I, I know when it comes to special needs children, some parents really don't cope with it well and they, they, they don't see past the exterior of, you know, they, they don't go deeper into what this experience is, is doing for them on a soul level and what they can bring to this soul. Who's an incredibly beautiful soul. Um, and with you, you have just taken on parenting in such a, with such grace, and with such an openness of heart, and that's that is exactly what Nova needs. You know, it's just somebody with an open heart. And I know it hasn't, I'm sure, been easy, but you have embraced it. And whenever I see parents embracing the gifts that their children are giving them, uh, I see the transformation and that's, that's really what I saw with you in in becoming a mom was uh, this transformation, which was beautiful to watch because it just added on to who you are as a human being, which is so lovely. And um, so this, this moment, I mean, it's been how old? So Nova's almost 10 now. Yeah. yeah. yeah, So it's like a 10 year journey with Nova and Trey and you didn't sing for, you stopped singing. How long did you stop singing for? Yeah, I released a track just after, just before Trey was born. It was called Shapeshifter. So I released online and Soul Candy took it up and released it as a compilation. And then in 2017, I released another track again. So I'd, I wasn't in the live space. I'd done like a few gigs early on, like after Nova was born, corporate and that sort of thing. And then a year ago, I had a very difficult time because I'd had this album out with Universal. It was my full-length album, and Craig Massive, my dear friend, produced it, who'd passed away. Mm-hmm. And so I decided, so it was actually more than a year ago, um, I decided, you know what, it's out of licensing with Universal. I'm going to put it out onto uh, Spotify and digital myself. And I hired these guys to market it and do the Spotify campaign it was supposed to be organic ads and this whole spiel. And um, to cut a long story short, they ended up using streaming bots and my album got banned on Spotify. Yeah, it was wow. just absolutely disheartening. And, um, and I really questioned if I even wanted to do music anymore. I was so close to just 
packing it up and just saying I'm not I'm actually not interested anymore because you can work for years put in so much money and you hire one idiot and mm-hmm. it takes your whole thing down like a house of cards it was just devastating to watch I'm sure. and so you know I just decided fine I'm not going to push getting this album out and I picked up my guitar again after so many years and I was like I'm going to learn how to play this thing again I started putting videos up on Instagram, which I think got like two or 300 views. It was hardly a viral thing. <laughs> but it forced me to show up on camera and to just put myself out there in a vulnerable way that it wasn't perfect and redo my songs, my dance tracks in acoustic versions and just interact with people and find the love and the passion in the music. And, and it goes way back to when I first started playing guitar that's when I really could, you know, love music again. So, um, and then I got a gig about a year ago. You remember Mike Kennedy? He did yes. events, yeah, yeah. He did an event out in uh, the Karoo in the deserts, and we got a little set together. Me and this guy, we played there. It was great. We had a wonderful time. Um, and then when I came back, I was just again, just like, you know what? I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So I sat in that space for a while thinking about it, just wounded um, from everything that had happened. And then I was just like recently something shifted and I was going through my hard drives and I found this beat that got sent to me from uh, Vusi V Underground, it goes by V Underground, and I was like, hmm, I'm actually quite, you know, enjoying this, having this idea that I'm going to do something maybe on TikTok or get something out on the socials. I was like, I can write something. And then I thought, okay, Vusi sent him a voice note. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, that sounds great. He says, but I've actually got this other track. Can you listen to it? And he mm-hmm. sent it through to me. And that was when I rolled, rolled, wrote uh, the latest one, Soulscape Philosophy. Mm-hmm. And it just came pouring out. I wrote it in one day. I did the backing vocals the next day and it was just like everything was saying, okay, now is the time. It's Mm -hmm. not going back to the band. It's going back into Deep House, Soulful House, Sunset Slots. Mm -hmm. You can do this. You know, it doesn't have to be a crazy all-nighter. You can totally envision yourself singing at Sunset and all these magical places and bringing soul back. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's just been like, bam, 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 one thing after the next, reaffirming mm. that now's your time and we need you here. <laughs> yeah. And do you think that your time away from singing has been good for you? And and if you do, what? how has it been good for you? It was really good for me because uh, it helped me to heal my, my physical body, mm. my emotional body, connect to here. Like I spent a lot of time alone um during COVID I'd I'd developed like an autoimmune issue so I was sick for a long time and I just was not interested in seeing people and through all of those stages I could hear my inner voice again I'd shut out so much from the external world that I could really hear the guiding voice this works this doesn't work this works this doesn't work Mm. so I wouldn't have done that before. It was just too frantic and too much distraction and um, rediscovering that passion again, knowing myself, maturing into a woman now, you know, mm. being a mother mm. and having the sense of wanting to do something for a deeper purpose, yeah. knowing you know, that I've achieved that place that I set out when I went to ayahuasca all those years ago to say, like, I want to, show up in a way that really can make a difference. And maybe it's not going to be every time with my lyrics or my music, but when I go out into places, I've got all of these other tools that I picked up along the way where face-to-face meetings become more valuable and meaningful. Mm. And so you're carrying it through into other parts of your life. So that space and that time away was was absolutely necessary. Mm. At the time, I didn't think of it, but now... <laughs> Now I can. Yeah, I think we spoke about this the other day, actually, because it happens. I think what we were saying was something about it happens a lot with women, especially when women um, Mm. have children. A lot of the times when women have children, we have to move away 
um, from whatever we're doing. I mean, I was a professional DJ. There was no way I was going to be doing that when I had babies. I tried for like two yeah, years. Yeah, you tried was, a little bit. <laughs> I tried, but it was not going to work. But um, the experience of being a carer for another human being and growing through that and dealing with your own traumas that you've had in your life um, as you've been growing up and having to face all your demons through your little children because they do, they all come up, um, really grows you as a human being. And when you step back, especially creatively, I notice this a lot with my creative friends, women, when they step back into that creative role again, when it's on their terms, because all of them come back on their mm. terms. They're like, I, I've, I've given myself to my children. I mm. have done my, I've, I've given that role to them. I've given everything for them and I don't regret it. That's something I wanted to do. But now if I'm going to be stepping back in, I need to be doing it for myself now. So everything mm. is on a much more authentic and, uh, yeah, very truthful level. And there's something in that person's art form, whatever the art form is, there's for their express their creative expression that is is so unique and um there's a maturity in their work. There's a it's just something that they could never have had before mm. that had this experience of being a parent. And, mm. um, and so I think we were sp talking specifically about like singing. You can hear it in your voice. When I heard your new song, I've heard your, I've heard you sing millions of times because you've sang next to me for so long. And just hearing that, first of all, hearing the lyrics and hearing how soulful the lyrics are and how much more sort of, connected to self and to mm. a higher expression of being a human they are and then hearing in your voice the way that you sing how much more depth there is and how much mm. more life there is that you are Coming from a different place now yes okay. yes yeah. very much so like which, actually physically like either from the throat or from yeah. the heart or from the solar plexus it's just it does it's it's changed physically. Yeah. So yeah. This vessel creates a different sound. Yeah. Like I know in my dancing, I was a dancer for many years and I've only recently started dancing again, like a year, uh, two, not even a year and I a half ago. That. I know. And <laughs> I, I just, it's so interesting because I feel like now when I dance, I just think, oh God, I wish I could, I wish I could have done this in my 16 year old body. I could wish I could have done, because I feel in myself, I can feel that I, oh God, would I, 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 there's just so much passion driving myself mm. through and, um, and sensuality yes, know, and, and yes. we understand our sexuality. It's like yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. I mean, I think. I'm so excited to see more dancing from you. <laughs> well, I don't know if I will be putting much more because I'm very shy. Come on. <laughs> but, but I will be, I'm going to carry on dancing. You know, that that I'm definitely going to do. Excellent. Um, so this new track of yours, um, I'd love to go into just briefly how the struggle when it comes to this thing called social media and having still having faith in yourself and having faith in your creativity and your art form, regardless of what the social media gods are saying mm -hmm. is important. You know, you, can you talk about that, uh, your experience with this when it comes to social media? What gave me confidence is that I decided to do a content strategy course. So I'd had a background in public relations you know, through the music, um, make, making connections through media and working at Soul Candy later on. I had an understanding of public relations. And so when people bring you something and they're like, hey, please promote me, um, I recognized that they were giving you pieces that didn't really make sense sometimes. So it took me to this 
this um, place of wanting to study content strategy so that I could really try and build an understanding of the brand and brand communications uh, from the foundational level as opposed to trying to just push something after everything has been decided. So mm. I, I realized, like, I need to learn more about this beast, this social media beast. It's, an, it's a necessary evil. I don't love it, but I have to do it because mm. nobody else is going to do it for me. So I studied this content strategy and and implemented the teachings for like a year and I've worked with other clients and I still do. I think that's what's given me a confidence to test stuff out because some of my stuff, when I look back, it's so cringy, but I've done it on purpose. I'm like, I'm putting this here and I'm leaving this here. And if you still stick around, then we are going to be friends for a long time because (laughs) obviously (laughs) you might, one of my people, (laughs) you know, because you have to show these, um, I can't remember where I heard this, but somebody was like, maybe it was even Gary Vee, but there was somebody who was like, document the journey. Don't just come out being like, yo, look at me and this super polished, amazing thing that I've created. There's just, it's unattainable to so many people. Mm. Um, and the true connection with your audience comes through showing the the journey of something. Yeah. So a part of that is like I also started this thing at the beginning of the year where I'm not good with journaling okay I really everyone's like journal journal I'm like nah I don't know about this you know <laughs> at most kids like super depressing I'm like no 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 so I said I thought okay um, I'm going to do video diary blogs so I started off every single day six o'clock just put my phone on and just speak to the phone and say video diary blog entry first of January whatever and I just talk and it was a, a study in, in, I guess, confidence and self-awareness and, mm-hmm. and watching yourself from a different perspective and coaching yourself to be able to, to, uh, to speak to others. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not something that is natural for me, uh, as, as natural as people might think. I've had to coach myself. So, yeah, I mean, it was every day and then it was like every couple of weeks and I'll just pop on every now and then and do a video diary. But there's been certain things I've had to implement and learn over the way so that I can recognize my strengths and weaknesses and go, okay, I need help with that. What am I going to do to mm. get through that? Yeah. And so this little video diary thing helped and the content strategy helps. And so if there are ways that 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 you can grow there are opportunities to help you to turn those weaknesses into strengths and just you've got to grab them you got to, mm. you've got to try yeah do you think it's vital for uh singers artists to be on social media do you think it is a must or very very it's it's actually music it in my opinion it's not about just music anymore people want to know who's behind music Mm. they want to connect with the person it's like personification who are you what are your values what is your lifestyle what is your what are your ethics like what am I buying into like why you out of everyone else yeah maybe sometimes the music's that good you get a follow but are you going to have really that kind of purpose-driven meaningful connection with your audience not everyone wants that hey Erica some people are just happy with that so it's a personal thing how do you want to show up and what kind of impact do you want to make in your communities with the voice that you have. Mm. Because if you are one of those people that do want to do something with the voice you have and the opportunities you have, then you've got to be honest and vulnerable and you've got to show up exactly as you are. That's how yeah. you're going to get loyalty with people. And yeah. That's what I, yeah, I believe that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a firm believer that people are just hating p- perfection nowadays you know everything has just been so in the past has just been so curated to the hilt and Mm. just I think people are just tired like it's it's Mm. it's just so refreshing (laughs) I just want to see normal people and I was off social media for a long time because I just couldn't stand I just couldn't stand it I was like everything looks so fucking perfect and it's just yeah. not and I would just think like oh my god my life is so far from perfect it's stop <laughs> like and I would meet people and think you you look like you are so perfect and I know you're not because I know you in person and it just wasn't yeah. correlating and now yeah. I'm finding that it feels like 
in some ways, social media is becoming more social in the way that people are actually building relationships with each other and actually being a lot more real with one another. And I'm hoping that's the way it's going to go um, because um, there are a lot of lonely people in this world and connection is such a beautiful thing if we can find it in a positive way, you know. Mm. And we see that with TikTok, haven't we? I mean, yeah. TikTok is really blown up because well, I it's don't know, just because so candid. <laughs> I don't go into TikTok. I don't know. <laughs> You, you tell me. <laughs> okay, so I mean, that is what's refreshing about it is that obviously you'll have people that spend a lot of time doing all the camera tricks and the editing and you'll have that, but mm. it's there's millions of of people that are just showing up in their pajamas and just talking shit and crying and being real. And, yeah. and that has um, been so refreshing to see. Yeah, yeah. I think also with lockdown and with COVID, people are – still recovering many people are recovering and they just it's unattainable they can't put out that kind of level of output of, of work uh forever if they're burnt yeah. out so it is so nice to be able to have people that you can just um chat to and yeah. you know show up as your as yourself like on socials you've got to you got to it's a mental shift though isn't it mm. hey like yeah going like it doesn't have to be perfect <laughs> yeah it's a big like I, I mean this this podcast is a perfect exact perfect example <laughs> because I mean everything like I was saying the audio is really shitty it's not great I mean I'm recording this on like a google meet and I I can't expect my even if I've got a microphone I can't expect my guests to all have a microphone it's not like that so most of the time the quality is not great but the conversations are important and it's a message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the message. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm just doing it messy. And I think that's what people maybe are after COVID. I think that's, that was maybe one of the benefits of COVID is that people mm -hmm. just have realized that it's okay to do things messy and just be real and just, Totally. not have to keep an act because you can't you can't keep up an act it's impossible and I think that's the the, the thing with podcasts I mean I can't if I was keeping up an act I don't know how I'd carry on doing this it would just not be sustainable because yes. I, I can only be me if I want to carry on doing this you know yeah and um, you said you've got to show up as you are you've yeah got to just show up as you are with what you have and and in time the more yeah. we do it, the more refined things will be. But hopefully we'll never lose that scrappiness, eh? Yeah, I don't want to. I really don't. I never want to lose it. So tell me, Pix, um, what's next for you? So you've got this uh, this, uh, this single out now. What's mm -hmm. next for you, do you think? Or do you are you planning? What are you planning? Well, I've got some. I just went to Joburg for the release of the, the track. Um, yeah. I went up to the label up there and we did a show up there. And it was really a very, um, what's the word? It was per like I did it, I don't want to say, what's the word I'm looking for? Not calculated, but strategic. Yes. I wanted to make it that, you know, I'm back. I'm here for collaborations. If you want to send me some tracks, I'm interested in listening and I'm available to play live. You know, it was really one of those kind of moments. Mm. So I got what I was looking for. Uh, I got, uh, by the time I was home, I got um, a couple of really positive opportunities on my plate. Great. And it really all involves getting back in studio and writing mm. and hoping that the right message and the right song comes to me for the people because I want to I want to sing songs people want to hear and need to hear. Mm. So I'm hoping that I can keep it at that level um, as Soulscape philosophy because it's been really interesting to see the reaction to it. Quite a mix of people that are more like on the spiritual path of healing and self awareness and from every stage of it to um, the bedroom producer up and coming, you know, Afro house, deep house producers and uh, guys living in townships. And that's what I love about, about deep house in South Africa. It's because it is a vehicle of hope and, mm. and there's just, 
there's no boundaries. Like we're connected through the love of rhythm and our African rhythm and Mm -hmm. soulful vocal and telling a story from a place where we collectively are experiencing the same things on a day to day. So I'm really excited to, to do that and to step out into that space and to integrate it into my life. That's um, my business life, you know, to Mm. see how, how that works. And the kids are older now and I've got a really great ex and a really great family unit of extended family that um, can support if I do want to travel and um, yeah, and the boys won't miss me as much. <laughs> they love their dad yeah. too. So yeah. So things like this that just reaffirm that this is the right time. So that's kind of where we're going and we want to, we want to make a difference with music and with events where we can teach the other things that we've learned and invite other people to join us to, to make an impact and uh, to connect on a human level in a way that people are really needing. Yeah. I love that. Thanks. And can I ask you to please give advice to, you know, so many people, especially creatives, they, when they're young, you know, got the world ahead of them. They've got their lifetimes ahead of them. So they're totally fine with just throwing themselves into this thing called Very their brave. music. Very brave. And then and then something like responsibility start to happen with children and everything. And so many people don't find their way back to their passions. They think, mm-hmm. oh, this is something I did in high school. Or this is something I did just after high school. Or this is something I did in my crazy 20s. And, you know, now I'm like, I've got a job and I've got a responsibility to take care of my family, but then there's always something that they're missing out on. There's something that they feel that's lacking in their lives. And I feel like these people who constantly are seeking this more success, more, whatever, they're Mm. not content. And, Mm. and usually it's because their passion, they're not, they're not, they've left their passion behind. So what advice would you give to people, you know, because this takes being an unreasonable human. Like you have to be a little bit unreasonable to say, no, it's time for me now to put mm-hmm. myself first. I've done this, but it's time for me now. And I'm going to find a way of doing this. You've had to, you like you said, you've got to have a support structure and you've got to have, mm-hmm. you know, be okay with the fact that you are going to have to be away from your kids a little bit, but, but there's, but that's important for your happiness because when you're happy, your family's happy and, you know, that's important. So what advice would you give to people who think it's, it's, it's not attainable for them, that going back to their passion is not something they can do? It's a very good question. I mean, what I, I think is important is that you got to spend the time on yourself So say you've been giving to everyone else, your kids and and everyone else. The first step is finding that that discipline to give time to yourself and have that relationship with yourself because you have to be your own best friend. Before your partner is your best friend or your children or your actual best friend, you have to be your own best friend first and be Mm -hmm. kind to yourself. And once you've given yourself that time, you know, you you mustn't be afraid to just be real and be vulnerable and show up as you are with what you have and just start and just get it out there because you don't understand how much you inspire people. Even if it's 30 people to start, they inspire another 30 people. It grows like wildfire. Mm-hmm. Um, and then reclaim and remember those parts of yourself. It isn't that you've lost them forever It's that they're awaiting the reclamation. Like you have to reclaim those parts of yourself and it is possible to do it uh, because you've already done it. You've already done this once, let's say, you know, we're talking about rediscovering those parts of yourself Um, and to remind yourself that, that you, you know, you owe yourself the, the chance to just give it a bash There was something that I thought of about the word inadequacy, the feeling of inadequacy, okay? And I thought the word inadequacy, it means like you even think that you're less than adequate. That's a pretty harsh way to to view yourself if you feel that, you know, you can't do something. Do you fear that you will be inadequate? 
Mm-hmm. And most of the time when you look at it, you think, no, it's, it's not that I feel that I'm going to be less than, you know, less than average. Like I think I've got a good thing going here. It's, you know, mm-hmm. I can do this. But just check yourself that you're not being too, like, trying to be too perfect because we don't have to be perfect, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's probably the advice I would give is like, and also be honest about your weaknesses and your strengths and what can you do to, to, to change those weaknesses? What tools do you need just to get through that, to get you to a place where you're comfortable to at least give it a bash again? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I know physically for me as a dancer, I had to really be, like honest with myself and no, like I can't dance barefoot anymore. I have to wear special shoes because otherwise I get tendonitis and I can't walk for two weeks. Yes. But but I dance again. I'm still yes. I'm dancing. Because you so, got your shoes. <laughs> I got my damn shoes. And now I'm dancing again. The girls got shoes. The girls got shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but that feeling of this is where I'm at. And even though I have maybe there's things that I that I have to relearn and I have to repractice and I have to get myself out there. There's other things that I'm bringing to the table. So mm-hmm. I'm bringing you things that I didn't have before, you know. Mm-hmm. I feel it's so vital for people to keep, to just keep doing what they're passionate about. Like, I you think it's, it. it's like yeah. you to yourself to just give it another try because yeah. otherwise it, it's just a very superficial way of living and it, it it just feels like you're treading water. I mean, at least if you fail, you can you can say, listen, I gave it a bash, you know. Chances yeah. are you're probably not going to fail. You're probably going to show up as a more authentic, wiser, stronger uh, kind of leader because in your age, in your wisdom, people now are like, okay, I'll listen to you. You're an older person. <laughs> yeah. My, my auntie or whatever. So <laughs> you, you have the ability to actually influence beyond what you think you might. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I've loved this conversation. I really Thank you, appreciated Pixie. you having me on this podcast, my friend. I was really touched when you invited me. And yeah, I, I just want to thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. So where can people listen to your song? Can you tell people? So, yeah, they can. Uh, if you would like to listen to Soulscape Philosophy, it is on Spotify and Apple and other streaming services. It's just under Pixie Bennett. Uh, two N's, two T's. So Pixie Bennett. And also I am on Instagram quite actively. I've got a link tree on there. So yeah, I would just also to... under Pixie Bennett's one yeah, word. All under Pixie Bennett, yeah. Okay, great. All right. So now to finish off my show, I'm gonna ask you three unreasonable questions. Okay. All right. So my first unreasonable question is what is your greatest fear? Hmm. My greatest fear is not having the physical capacity to deal with change. So like, you know, that I will be burnt out or exhausted or literally just like unable to physically get up Mm. (laughs) and deal with life. Yeah, Yeah. I love that. What is your most unreasonably magical moment? You can say one. I mean, I'm sure there's probably many, but what is one of your most unreasonably magical moments of your life? Yeah. Yeah. The birth of both my children is the most unreasonable. You know, to to decide to have my kids, to have my kids, to raise my kids, like, yeah, that's to me been one of the most magical experiences. Yeah, you know what I find with with children. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have kids at at home, I find it crazy that in hospitals you have this child, and then. Three days later or two days later, however long, they give you this newborn child, human, and they just go, here you go. You've never done this before. Yeah. Away with you. Now yeah, raise good, the- luck. good luck. Keep them alive. <laughs> They're like, we didn't tell you a whole lot of stuff because we didn't want you to be afraid, but it's going to be very hard. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be so hard. Nobody ever told you. So <laughs> If we told you, you wouldn't have done it. Trust me, you're going to love it later on. <laughs> Seriously, I think, honestly, I think parenting is honestly one of the most unreasonable things a person can do. It's 
crazy. Anyway, I love that. Yeah. Okay. My last question is, what is your definition of an unreasonable human? Going against the grain. Going against what everyone has told you, you are capable of doing or you're not capable of doing or what you should be doing. Yeah. And going against the grain. That is what unreasonable is. Mm, Yeah, it is. That's what it is. And you're one of those, which I love. (laughs) Thank you, my darling. And you. You're very unreasonable. How can I even reason with such an unreasonable human being? (laughs) Oh, my friend. Thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. And I can't wait to see uh, where the singing takes you and I'm so glad that you're doing it again because you've got such a beautiful voice and uh your besides a beautiful voice your your songwriting is just on another level it's so beautiful you are such a poet and uh I'm so glad that you're sharing that with the world again um and I can't wait for people to go and listen to your new song and to listen to all your other songs and because you deserve to be heard so thank you my friend darling. Bye. Well, that's it for today's episode of Unreasonable Humans. Thanks so much for joining me. Please follow the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. And remember that a great rating goes a very long way to support the show. Until the next one. Bye.